Upton, Howard Oliver, and Jonathan Bird. Apparently, you have been introduced to all of the panelists except Jonathan, so we welcome Jonathan. Um, the biographies of all of these gentlemen can be found in your material. If you haven't read them already, you should have. We're not going to waste time on introductions because we really want to get to the meat of the discussion. We don't have a long time together. So I will tell you that the qualifications by which these panelists were chosen is that they are considered to be thinker practitioners. They are men that have studied God's Word and really grappled with that Word. They have thought through their times, the times that they are called to minister in, and um, they have attempted to bring that Word to those times, and they have lived out what they will be sharing with you. So those are the qualifications, and they are good qualifications. We're hoping to get out of this evening some really practical advice, some really practical pointers. We are, and this word is to you, we are looking not for broad discussions and ideas, but really focused responses that, uh, that can give us as thinker practitioners something to take into our ministry. To those of you that will be participating by listening, um, I would remind you that we are not here to seek the right answer. You will not be asked to vote at the end of this on which answer you like the most. We hope that there are answers that you disagree with. We hope that there will be answers that you need to struggle through and with. That's the point of this discussion. If you can listen in the context of the old Indian legend, of the four blind men that were asked to describe the elephant. You all know it. One gentleman said, an elephant is like a snake. The other said, no, no, it's like a wall. The third said, no, an elephant is like a tree. And the fourth said, no, an elephant is like a rope. We are seeking here to describe the elephant. And we are really hoping that the perspectives of each of these thinker practitioners will cause you to look at your ministry and um, your lives in a new and exciting perspective. So, with that tone said, I will just uh, make one more statement that we want the answers to, we want everyone to be able to respond to the questions. So I will say no more. Name a book, gentlemen that has had significant impact on your ministry. And it can be one that you yourself have written. No. <laughs> oh, oh, yes. Yes, of course. Well, we'll just leave that an open question. <laughs> uh, boy, asking someone like us to name one book would be really tough. Um, I think probably the book that has informed me the most about urban ministry is a book by Robert Linthicum, uh, City of God, City of Satan, mm -hmm. a biblical foundation for urban ministry. Could you spell the author's last name for us? No. Linthicum? It's with an L. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's L I N T H I C U R. Google it. Yeah. Perfect. But the, the title of City of God, City of Satan is probably not like too many other books. So. Excellent. Okay. But I'll throw in a, a, a freebie. And that is the book that has helped me understand ministry in a Canadian city context it is not a Christian book. It's a secular book by Broadbent entitled Urban Nation. Excellent. And that's a must read for anybody in Canadian urban ministry. Excellent. Interestingly, the, uh, the story of the four Indians is actually six and it's by Ogden Nash. 
And, uh, and the moral of the story is that blind theologians talk about a God they've never seen. And it's not a bad moral, and it might be where we are today in terms of community development. Uh, Benjamin Tona is a South American liberation theologian uh, who has written a wonderful book called Gospel, Gospel for the Cities, and it has probably influenced me more than any other book. The last name again? Tona. Tona, T-O-N-N-A. You know, uh, I, got, I have to give two. Um, one's theological and one's practical. Uh, Brueggemann's, um, well, three. <laughs> Walter Brueggemann wrote a book called The Land, um, which has been immensely influential. Um, there's another book uh, by another Old Testament theologian by the name of uh, Christopher J. H. Wright. He's written a trio of books on Old Testament ethics that's been reprinted under one volume. I can't remember the title of it, but the, that is hands down the, the best theological grid for me. So what was the name of the author you know? That was um, Christopher J. H. Wright, W-R-I-G-H-T. And finally, the practical book that uh, I, I insisted that everybody to read was Brian Myers' Walking with the Poor. Say the name again. Brian Myers, uh, Walking with the Poor. Uh, two books uh, jumped out in my mind, little nuggets. Uh, the first was a compilation of letters written by Octavia Hill, who I mentioned to you last night. A woman in the uh, mid-18, late 1800s who uh, ended up managing a lot of properties, uh, slum properties, uh, in London. Uh, her letters to her property managers have been bound, and uh, that book is called The Befriending Leader. And I've given it to all of our property managers because it is so practical. And then the other one that has touched me very deeply is a fairly uh, recent book. Well, I guess it's five years now. Uh, um, Mother Teresa. It was a book that on her, uh, her letters to her spiritual advisor uh, about the darkness in her soul. And uh, that was a very... Uh, it was, a, it was a dark book that touched me in my dark places. Thank you. Okay, let us begin at the beginning. For many churches, putting a toe in the water of community development is offering clothes or food. What is the new toe in the water you propose from a community development perspective? In other words, what is a starting point for a church to begin in this area of community development? We'll walk back down this way. We will. Yeah. Um, I think for me, the first, uh, the first thing I would uh, encourage a church, is this on still? Yeah, uh, with encourage church to look at it, it's not on. What do we need to do? Uh, yeah, there we go. It, uh, for a church to uh, define its parish, uh, define its, uh, its target area, preferably the area around it, and uh, do baseline data on that community to find out uh, what the issues, concerns, and potentials are for that community. As opposed to starting a program, uh, look, at the, look at the neighborhood as a starting point. Well, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> um, but I'll say that uh, tomorrow night I'll, I'll hopefully give it a, uh, a good rationale for why food can't be an excellent starting place. And I was going to say the same thing with one word, listen. Spend a year, two years, or more listening to the community. Uh, this morning I mentioned a guy named Bill Iverson, who was a Presbyterian church planter in Newark. And uh, we went, actually took our conference board of evangelism, a whole bunch of white guys from small towns and rural areas, and we went down to Newark and we said, Bill's going to teach us what we need to know about urban evangelism. And he said, uh, So you really want to learn? I said, yeah. He said, well, get in my van. We all got in his van, took us down 
to one of the worst neighborhoods in Newark, which is unlike any worst neighborhood in Toronto. And he dropped us off two by two on street corners and said, I'll be back in an hour and a half to pick you up. <laughs> he said, I want you to walk around this block and ask everybody you meet. Tell them that you're starting a church here and ask them what advice they would have. And you know what? We learned everything we needed to learn. And I think that, I don't know what else to do. Um, you just start by asking the people who live there. Howard, if you could pass the mic to Rick. 